everybody. I am Marina Malaguti and I'm your host at Embossed. Embossed is a podcast I've created to highlight women with amazing paths of success here in Chicago. Last year, I set out to interview the only 40 female CTOs in the city. And this year, I've expanded to uh, female CEOs and women in politics and government in Chicago. I'm excited to share these interviews with you and I hope you contact me at www.unbossed.io or email me at marina at unbossed.io. Hope to see you soon. Dr. Kim Fountain is currently Chief Administrative Officer at Center on Hosted, the Midwest's larger LGBTQ community center and the finance chair of the board of directors for the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum. She has been involved in the LGBTQ plus movement professionally since 1995 and has published in academic journals, in edited, edited volumes, and in organizational reports on this work. Her public speaking engagements range from industry conference presentations to local and global audiences to keynote addresses in media and media engagements. Welcome, Kim. Hey, everybody. This is Marina, your host at Unbossed. Um, Today's guest is a really cool woman. Her name is actually... uh, let me redo that because I don't know if you go by her and, and she. I, I use uh, she, her, they, them. But thank okay, you perfect. for, thank you for <laughs> I don't want to assume. Okay, great. Hey, everybody. This is Marina, your podcast host at Unbossed. I have a special guest today with me. Her name is Kim Fountain. She is Chief Administrative Officer at the Center on Halstead. Thank you for joining me today, Kim. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, and I apologize if I kind of butchered your last name. Uh, my accent is what it is. <laughs> oh my goodness, it was beautiful. Okay. Said it. It was absolutely perfect. Okay, great. Um, so I we're gonna get to talking about some really, really, really important topics here. By the first question I ask, I'm gonna take you back a little bit. The first question I always ask is, Kim, tell us who are you? Where did you come from? What is a little bit of your story for context? Uh, Maybe a a fun story about you as a little girl. Sure. So I grew up in the 70s and 80s. So, uh, you know, before the internet, before cable TV came around, you know, so, um, you know, kid that was, I grew up in a really working class town uh, in the middle of Massachusetts with a dad who had been in the military for many years and came out and worked in a factory. And then my mom is Japanese and she grew up during war and U.S. occupation. And so uh, really carries a lot of that with her. And, um, you know, when I was a kid, I did a lot of reading. You know, I was one of those voracious readers that they talk about. So, yeah, I was reading John Hersey's The Wall, which is about uh, Jews during the, uh, you know, World War II in the Polish ghetto over to like, Right. And over to like, you know, Richard Llewellyn's How Green Was My Valley about Welsh coal miners and what happens when the coal mining industry leaves. So lots of books that, you know, and I was doing this at like 13 or so, right? So young. And so I developed this real sense of, you know, what is just and what is not just and, and, you know, what are your commitments to your people and where do you hold your line? You know, so those are really important to me. And so as a young kid, you know, I was considered, uh, you know, in the seventies, I was called the tomboy, right? Like that, that little girl who sort of ran around, climbed trees, and you know, played football with the guys, and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, now we just call us girls, girls. Right? <laughs> right? But Normal. at the time, Normal. that's not what it was. Right? <laughs> and um, so I would have this sense, you know, my parents would throw these parties with all their friends, and there'd be boys my age there, and. It was you know time to clean up and be like okay girls get in the kitchen do the the dishes and the boys don't have to do that and I'd be like um, I'm not touching a dish until that person that guy comes over and helps me wash and you know so I spent a lot of my life doing things like that my early formative years you know that's yeah. not fair <laughs> yeah it's not fair why am I doing that I I growing up with a brother myself. I had a lot of that because we were very close in age and it was like, why doesn't my brother have to do this? I'm not doing that. If he's mm-hmm. not. <laughs> right. Exactly. Going on strike, you know, and my father was a union steward. So, you know, the idea of I'm going to go on strike actually meant I'm not going to do it unless we get some justice. So. Oh, wow. So he, he did, he 
in some way negotiated this and 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 cultivated your he did yeah he was a great dad that way yep it's awesome so what your mom you, you mentioned your mother was was japanese was was she traditional in her in her culture and and how did she formed your your vision of the world at that age mm -hmm. you know it's interesting um she grew up very very poor you know sort of one room homes with you know seven you know six siblings and two parents and you know um not knowing where they were going to eat the next day not knowing you know, they had one set of clothes for the warm weather one set of clothes for the cold weather just real extreme poverty so in terms of tradition um yes but not in terms of what people might consider traditional japanese culture in today's world you know what i mean so uh but she did very much grow up with the idea that you know she was going to take care of the house and she the, the home was her realm and you know but she also grew up working 12 hour days at age 12 you know she left home at age 12 to go to work wow you know so um yeah so that you know there was a lot of instilling in her kids this idea that you work hard you know make certain that you you take care of yourself a real sort of that sort of self-reliance um and also you can build a home you know with other people in it where there's yeah. love and caring you know so it's nice it's nice yeah and um pointing out i think a little bit of the obvious here but 70s and 80s and is an interracial marriage how did that impacted uh your upbringing so my mother was a hostess in the Tokyo bars, uh, which is a little different from what you might, it's not like a, will, I can seat you here moment. It, she got paid a percentage of the drinks that she would, uh, that would be served to the uh, U.S. Uh, Army guys that would be at the bar. And so she, that's how she met my dad. And uh, they, he fell in love. He, even before he met her, he was in love. He would tell the story of looking over to his friend and pointing my mother out and saying, that's the woman I'm going to marry. And he did, and they did it till death do they part, and it was a lovely marriage, and it was amazing. And um, my maternal and paternal grandparents did everything they could to stop that marriage, Yeah, you know, uh, and eventually uh, came around and uh, to the point where I'm pretty sure my grandfather liked my mother more than he liked his kids, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. Um, so how did that inform your view, if at all, of the world or affected it, uh, you know, growing up? So they were amazing. They So, you know, when my father what, came home from the military or from Japan with my mom, the military told him, you're going to need to leave your wife with your parents in Massachusetts uh, while you get transferred down south to a base because it's not going to be safe for her. And, um, you know, so he left. So he left his career in the military, um, stayed with my mom. And when I came out to them in the mid 80s, they were able to tell me, you know, this is who you love. Goodbye us. Oh. You know, that's and, and, and I learned that from them. Yeah, this was the mid 80s where other people's kids weren't coming out, mm -hmm. you know, in these small towns, not in the same way, you know, in their sphere. Yeah, they did later, <laughs> several of them, but you know, it, they, it, so they understood that if you love somebody, it doesn't matter what society tells you, you know, that, uh, you, you, it's perfectly fine. And so that to me was worth fighting for. Absolutely. And yeah. And so when I got older, I ended up doing an entire dissertation for my PhD on what society does to mold individuals into being, you know, a good citizen and what kind of violence does that involve in sort of cutting out parts of somebody's identity that don't mesh well with what society considers those normative values. And, um, yeah, so that, that helped. Nice. And there's so much good work that you have done around the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, and I, I, I'm going to go out and let and say like, not this, uh, you know, like there, there's always that coming out story and I'm sure it was very personal to you. So feel free to tell me however it was, but, um, however the experience was, but like you said, there were not many people coming out when you, when you were doing that. Can you tell me like what, 
um, made you want to come out? And maybe um, did you find support, some, some type of a support in the community? Was that like a first mentorship experience you've had? How did that happen? Sure. I came out in college. So I went to UMass Amherst and they had a really large LGBTQ population. And um, I found really good friends and some who were straight allies and others who were in the community. And uh, I understood that I could have a very diverse group of friends um, yes. and it all worked out just fine. And so my parents also set the precedent that I could tell them anything that I wanted to share with them. I could share that I, from an early age, that was true. And they also brought me up with this, uh, I consider a rather dirty trick of theirs, which was to say that uh, they couldn't tell me what to do or define who I was. And so I was like, that's right. I can do whatever I want. I'm responsible for myself. And then I realized that means I can't blame anybody else for anything. Ooh. And I was like, wait, no, 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 no. <laughs> that's not right. You know? And um, But you learn that for, if you learn that really young, then you know, sharing and coming out and all it was very natural for me. You I know? Was, yeah, I was att paying attention to your parents' uh, lessons because they seem really great parents. And I was like, I'm a parent myself. I have three girls now and I'm trying to teach these lessons. <laughs> and that's a good one. I'm going to use that. <laughs> I'll let you know how that goes. Exactly. Well, the other one they taught me that I was, was so valuable to me is that they were human beings. Yeah, they were flawed. They were, you know, they had their own problems and I was not the absolute center of the universe. They had their own lives as well, which was great for me to understand, you know, because I, yeah, I took care of myself. I did the things I needed to do. And, but I also included them because I wanted them involved. And so coming out to them felt natural because if they were going to be involved in my life, I'd want them to know who I was dating, you know, and beautiful. That was, I nice. just, I really hope uh, my kids feel the same way one day. Oh, it's I'm sure. We'll get interviewed by a Okay, so you obviously have a very, I'm going to say extensive because I want to, it's not necessarily, you, you've you put in your ears, but also is like very deep grain work into uh, the community. Um, and at the cost of glossing a little bit over the details here because we want to get to the meat, would you mind give, giving us like a recount of uh, you went to college, uh, you got an, a degree in anthropology and women's studies, and then how did you come to uh, the evolution of Kim um, or Kim now today as a center on Halstead? Great question. Um, so what I did right after graduating from my undergrad is I got on my motorcycle in Massachusetts and went to California. Wait, what motorcycle? I have one. Yeah. Oh, it was just a little Honda Custom. But okay. it got me across the country on, I think, you know, $60 of gas or something Perfect. like that back in the day. And went to California, did several years out there where I just became an adult in many yes. ways, sort of did life on my own and um, then decided to go to graduate school. And I went to graduate school back in New York City. So I spent 15 years there in total learning a lot about violence. And so what I did in my graduate program was to really think about, um, you know, I had engaged in every argument you can engage in around sexuality, around, you know, the religious <laughs> point of view, the scientific point of view, right? right all these different. And I realized that religion was the one place I didn't feel like I should be arguing mm. in terms of, you know, what somebody be believed, because that was their deeply held belief. But until I could figure out how to have those conversations, I'd be missing a lot of the work that needs to be done in terms of our liberation work for the LGBTQ community. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Because I think mm -hmm. you've made an important point, but I, I, I think I'm missing it. What is sure. It? It's, it's that I can argue politics with somebody in science, right? The science is this or the science is that. And, that, and, and, and I'm fully comfortable with that. And I'm fully comfortable with a political argument around rights. Um, what I wasn't as comfortable with are some of these feelings, right? And what we've learned in movement building is it's the feelings that are the important parts of any <clears throat> sort of like struggle to address. Because you can have those sort of Facebook level kind of arguments with somebody, or you can sit down face to face with somebody and talk with somebody about their feelings, you know? And when, when you can do that in a respectful, productive manner, you you know you get moved along with them yeah so you realize it's not just i'm gonna pull them over to my side it's also 
where are we going to come to some sort of common ground and some sort of understanding of what connects us as two individuals? And then we can move from there. And so that to me, so I spent my graduate school career doing that kind of learning and that kind of uh, thinking. So, so as an anthropologist, it wasn't just that I wanted to do theoretical work, although the New School for Social Research was all about books and reading and lots of theory and dense theory. And, you know, um, but I took all of that and I get, when I got a job at the, you know, I was working at the New York City Gay and Lesbian Center <clears throat> back, it, now it's the New York City LGBTQ Center, I think. Um, but back in the day, and I did that and got to meet a lot of my different community members from all over the globe. And that was wonderful. And then worked for the Anti-Violence Project. And when I went to work for the Anti-Violence Project, what I learned there were that there's these things called systems. And mm -hmm. absolutely knew that there were systems sort of, you know, you get that there's you know, education and religion and law enforcement and things like this. But what, what I didn't understand fully until then is how those systems operated on in the lives of individuals. Mm. So that's what I learned, you know, and had to understand that when I would be standing in front of the New York City Department of Health and they would lean over at these, you know, in, uh, from their sort of podium and there'd be a crowd out there and I'd be talking about, you know, transgender youth in need of housing and they would lean in and say, Oh, the New York City Department of Health is not ready for trans youth, and I'd be like, "What? What? That's that, that can't be true, you know." And this was the '90s, right? So this was this is you know, and so in those moments, I realized that um, you know I had to really understand how to marry you know what people were saying about how people thought and why people thought and why people felt to what were people doing and what were systems doing. And when I could figure out what those intersections were, then I could start to dismantle things. Yeah. But you can't just dismantle. You also have to either reassemble or assemble from whole, you know, something different. Yeah. And so it became, sure. yeah, that importance of, of really uh, stopping those systems from harming while also empowering the communities and, you know, um, and cross-sector communities to come together and sort of build our power and, and build our influence. Yeah. So, so why were what was that maybe lesson or two that you learned about how the system work and how they do affect the lives of individuals? So how do like as a person who has not done that type of work, uh, can you help me understand how may I, as an individual that may want to change something for better uh, for the betterment of society? may approach the systems? I'd say find your people. You okay. know, find the people who are going to um, be your, your great thought partners and your, your sort of co-conspirators, you know, your, co -con your collaborators, you know, like find those people and learn what they've already done. Is that within the system or you mean? No, no, outside, you know, outside the system. And there are some good people inside the system too that you can find, right? But usually you want to be with a good group of folks who are working outside the system. It is that age old question that Audre Lorde asked us, right? Can the master's tools dismantle the master's house? So do you want to be in? Do you want to be out? I, I, I have a foot in both. Okay. It's important to me because I get to leverage my privileges within the system and then I get to be somebody who works shoulder to shoulder with folks outside the system. So those are important. Um, and how, how, what was that? What, what did you find out? How does that system actually work? Why would the Department of Health say they're not ready in the 90s for, for just for one reality? We know that probably the person that was speaking cared mm -hmm. about trans folk. Right. So this is probably my nerdiest that I'll get during this, during this Let's interview. Do it. But systems are set up to preserve and perpetuate the norm, right? The mainstream, right? Call it hegemony, right? It is the, it is the, we're, you know, every system from every point, whether it's, you know, law, health, schools, all of those places are all saying the same thing, right? In different ways and in using different language. But the whole purpose of that whole system is to protect mm -hmm. the people in power, right? And the groups in power. Not the When I say people, people think of like individuals with power. But that's not what I mean. I'm talking like, you know, entire populations. And who would say that's not true? That's absolutely not what's happening. You know, the system's protecting order and stopping chaos and, 
creating safety. And what you realize when you really start to look at how they're doing it and who they're excluding and on whose backs it's, it's being done, you realize, oh, it's really preserving the power of a certain group of folks. And the important lesson in that for me is that so that when you gain power as a group, you have to understand that you're being absorbed in some ways by those folks in power. It's not necessary that you've cracked something open or, and sometimes you do, right? But be very, very wary of the moments where you feel like you've won something and you realize that you've won something because somebody else has lost something significant. So I think about marriage equality in the LGBTQ community and how people, how many people were pushing for marriage equality. And I always think that everybody should have the same rights as everybody else. Absolutely. Yay. And that was an absorption moment. The LGBTQ communities lost a lot of our transformative power when we moved into the marriage equality realm because we were less threatening at that point. So our ideas were less revolutionary. And we really want to push for those revolutionary ideas as a community-based or, you know, movement, ident um, identity-based movement because I think, because you want to transform society, right? And y focusing rather on having the state in my world, you know, saying, yes, it's good, great that you're coupling. So, yay, couple, and here are all your rights. What if I want more than one partner? What if I want single payer health? What if I don't, what if I want immigration reform that doesn't involve having to marry somebody? You know? Um, Absolutely. Those are the things, those are the transformative moments that I really feel like the LGBTQ movement still has in our sort of DNA, if you will. Um, but it, it makes it harder when you lose parts of your movement because you've been absorbed. You know? mm. That is, I never thought about it that way. I think there was always this idea that we understand that something radical when accepted becomes less radical or less mainstream, right? When accepted by a, a I thought it was more like a critical mass, but I think uh, that critical mass may actually just entail a group of people that are in power and whichever group that is in different situations, right? Um, and there's power there, right? Because you do move, you move that mainstream into something that better reflects what you want in the world, which yeah. is wonderful. But in terms of like deconstruction, that, you know you really have to watch that absorption moment. Yeah, which I think was my next thing about that because you mentioned that and, and, and it, you said sometimes we dismantle and sometimes we change incrementally perhaps. And what have you found works best in which scenario? It, it, which scenario? So, so what I mean is sometimes the, the group can dismantle things or maybe... Uh, radically change, if you will, like uh, concepts and or, you know, like like passing marriage equality, which was like, I feel like it was like a big step. Mm -hmm. But sometimes there are those incremental changes that then make up for like a larger, you know, change. Right. And so have you, have you found, and I think this applies because we all have the same um, decisions to make when we, we find something that is broken or a process that is not working, do we dismantling or even a product that is not working? Mm -hmm. Do we dismantle and start from scratch or do we change it just a little bit and try to figure out if something else new? And have I, you, do you have a strategy on how you pick which, which one to go with? Right, right. I, I think it all has to be done at once, right? I always say thank goodness for the extremely radical people in the world and the activists who are like, you know, chaining themselves to fences and getting arrested and, you know, occupying spaces. And that's amazing. It is not, you know, I got to protest things like this. Yes. But, you know, I'm not putting myself in a lot of harm's way in terms of uh, the, you know, to the extremes that other folks go, which is super important. Um, you need that in the world. You need those like real strong voices and you need the, po the voices, I think from within the system that say, we're going to go through these incremental stages you know, we're working on a policy with uh, a group of us, a coalition of us are working on the policy with uh, the Chicago Police Department on their, uh, you know, arrest and holding uh, policies with trans communities. And it's been a several year process, you know, so, you know, <laughs> there are those in incremental moments, which, you know, really lay a strong base. And then there's also moments where you've got to punctuate it with really rapid, really aggressive changes, you know, uh, they're both needed. Yeah, absolutely. I 
I, I think this that's really good. And and the fact that we do need both, I think, is probably it, the most important answer I've got. <laughs> this is that we definitely need like real big change and at the same time the work the workings. What I loved about um so Ruth Bader Ginsburg really mm -hmm. nailed this for me. You know, yeah. when she was talking about, you know, do you make a federal law for something like Roe v. Wade or do you have the states sort of do, you know, make these changes within the states? Yeah. Well certainly she, she you know she was instrumental in all that in getting, you know, the uh, in Roe v. Wade to be a law, right? Clearly. Um and also believe that you've really got to speak to the hearts and minds at the state level, right? That you you can pass a big law, for instance, but if you don't do the work on the ground of making certain that you're implementing that and you're getting people to understand what it means and you're just almost relentless about getting out there with your messaging, people won't understand why that big law is making them do something. Yeah. Right? They, it's, and that speaks to the, I think, your point of absorption, too, because the work doesn't stop when uh, marriage equality law is passed. The right. work has to continue, and actually ha marriage needs to happen. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, it doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, so at this point, I think we are at anti-violence and project. Okay. And then we were moving on to, that was like 10 years. And that was yeah. a lot of that. It was, it sounds like it was a great experience. Um, then you move on to be an executive director at Price Center uh, of Vermont. And then finally we are moving into the center of the house, Halstead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, when I went, when I moved out of New York city, there's a little bit of burnout there, right? Because it's a seven day a week job you know, there's a bullhorn in my desk there, you know, it's just always, just always out there, you know, one minute I'm protesting with a bullhorn and the next minute I'm sitting next to a mayor whose team I was probably just protesting in the morning, right? So there's just so much work happening all the time. And again, it was about trauma, you know, about holding fathers, you know, on the sidewalk whose son was just murdered and he didn't even know he was gay. So he's finding out he's murdered and he's finding out he's gay all in the same moment. So there are those moments too, where you're just like, okay, you know, how many times are you going to do those things before you realize I need to just remove myself from the situation for a little while? It's like emotionally draining. Uh, sure. Talk a little bit about how did you co uh, cope? How did you do it for 10 years? And, and mm -hmm. was there any technique that you used to self care? through those moments. You know, we talk a lot in this moment um, about, uh, you know, and, and this comes, this is a particularly uh, poignant for me, I guess, is that we just lost one of our community members uh, who was um, an amazing activist and colleague here in Chicago. And they were queer, they were black, they were, you know, non-conforming, they were just uh, heavily engaged in, um, anti-violence work and in sex workers rights and just amazing things. And they committed suicide this weekend. And that happens for so many different reasons. And what it makes you stop though, and, and say to yourself, you know, we're in, for those of us who are engaged in movement building work, so much of it is just pulled out of you, right? Having to do the emotional labor of caretaking and of educating and of passionately trying to get somebody to understand why what is happening in society and in these systems is harming the people that you love in the world, right? So you're putting out, you're putting out all the time and you have to ask yourself, what is filling you back up? Mm. You know, what, you know, and so, you know, I remember you had asked me uh, earlier, uh, you know, in, uh, when we were talking prior to yeah. this, about some of the lessons that I've, I've learned, right? Some yeah. things that are really important, right? And one of the things can I, I about- sorry, Can I acknowledge the fact that uh, that is, uh, I, I'm sorry that that, that person obviously uh, committed suicide and, and, and I feel like, all, you know, unless it was unavoidable, that, that shouldn't happen in society. And I want to make sure that, that it's a moment that we take for, for mm -hmm. that for that person and for other people who are going through it, like to seek the help you need in order to get well. Absolutely. And sometimes it's, you know, it, it, and there's no, we don't know, you know, with suicide, especially, you know, there are, like you said, there are so many underlying factors and reasons, you know, and 
that, you know, we're able to take that moment of reflection and step back and say, how do we take care of each other? Yes. Right. And how do we, and I'm not saying that had somebody done X, Y, and Z differently with this person, it would have been a different outcome because we know yes. that it's not yeah. how that works. Right. But we also though are able to step back and say, how do we make certain that we're checking in on each other? How do we make, and this is, and this is how I did this for the, the 10 years I was at the anti-violence project. And also to say that from 2000 at the anti-violence project, yeah. So now in 2021, I've had an LGBTQ anti-violence project everywhere I've worked. Wow. So this work hasn't stopped just because I moved from that particular organization. Oh. So I've been doing this for a long time. Yeah. And when I was in it, what I had to make certain I did was to develop a home life and an outside life, outside of work life that was fulfilling. Okay. You know, there's that, you know, a lot of, a lot of folks who are advocates and ad activists have a sort of fear of missing out mentality. Like oh, I've got to be at that protest. I have to be at that meeting. I've got, you have to be recharging your batteries. Yeah. You have to be eating well. You have to be, you know, doing something that like pulls you out of that world for just a little bit. So you can do that yeah. rest and recharging. Um, is that, is that, sorry, I was interu I interrupted you. You were about to, about to tell me about the lessons learned. Is this one of the lessons? Right, yes. It's to make sure that you develop that that world outside of work and outside, yeah. or or if it's not work, if it's still, if it's activism that you're involved in as something outside of that, that you do do develop things that are equally as fulfilling, yeah. you know? Um, and I, so for me, that's super important. It's, 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 it is, if you don't develop that balance, you really can find yourself burned out. And so I burned out, right? So then when I went to Vermont, I went to a very small organization that had an anti-violence project in it that was still doing great work. And, um, but I was on 15 acres on a river for my home. <laughs> my dogs got to run free for like, you know, as long as they wanted, you know? So it was just, that was just a really good thing for me to, you know, recharge so that when, for instance, a trans man, Amos Beattie, was murdered in Vermont. My team could show up and show up strongly for him, you know, yeah. for him, his friend, for his family. So we still dealt with really hard things, but for me, it was just I took a breather, you know, in terms of you know, in New York City, it was just nonstop all the time. It just did you ever have that? And by the way, I am extremely happy that you recognize that you needed that and that you took it for yourself and you took the space and the time, like. I'm not, I, by this question, I'm not faulting you in any way, but did you ever feel like you should have been working more, or being there, or, and, mm -hmm. and how did you maybe like deta deta detach a little bit and allowed yourself to really like be in the moment of recharging for people it that was, can connect? Yeah, it was, re it was difficult because, you know, y you know, even now, I start work at five in the morning and I end sometime in the evening. You know what I mean? So like, I'm just, I, I work that is just in who I am, yeah. but where I focus my energy really matters, mm. you know? So tell me more. So like, and, and, and also like super curious, just side, quick side. If you could tell me about like, how does that work in like COVID times being in front of the computer all the time and zoom and, all this draining, life draining technology <laughs> schools. Right, right. You know, I really, and I tell my, so I have a group of, you know, about eight directors below me, right, in terms of like the org chart, right? And so they're the, they're the teams that get things done at Center on Halstead, a lot of the program work and things like this. I mean, in terms of programs, right? So their teams gets that, the programmatic work done. And, um, I always tell them they have a really thankless position because middle management is so tough, yes. right? Like you don't have enough power to get something done, but you have all the expectations that you get it done. Yeah. So that's a really tough place to be. So when I was in that position, I had a hard time with work-life balance, mm -hmm. right? That was a tough, that was tough for me. Um, you know, cause even when I took vacation, I'd be working, right? Mm -hmm. I'd be engaging, I'd be doing, you know? So as a leader now, what I try to do with my teams especially during COVID is to give them space, right. To be able to say, why are you answering my email on a Saturday? <laughs> I didn't say you need to, I said, you know, my, I will send emails at ridiculous times, but my teams know between nine in the morning and five in the evening, Monday through Friday is when I want an answer sometime in there, you know? And so I do, I check in with them and I say, you're going to burn out this. You, you have to step away from your computer 
it's my job to tell them to do this, even in the back of my head, if I'm going, oh, this has to be done. Oh my goodness. But that's about me, right? That's my schedule, my, you know, and it's my responsibility to turn to the people who are asking me for these things and saying, if you ask me for that on a Monday, that means my team has to work on the weekend. So I'm going to be able to give, I need to give them some time on Wednesday and Thursday. Absolutely. You know, you know, it, in, in COVID culture, one of the things I learned is how I recharged my batteries mm. on, um, like if I would take the subway down to, or the train down to, you know, into, um, the loop, I would have a half hour to prepare in between meetings to listen to my music or whatever I would do for a half hour until I got there. Not, not COVID COVID. It was, here's your noon meeting. Here's your one meeting. Here's your two meeting. And so I've also tried to talk to my teams about stepping away from the computer. And so we instituted, you know, and it's going to sound like such a minuscule amount of time, but I said one hour every week, I want you to spend just visioning and creatively thinking about your program. I don't want it. And they had the hardest time. They still have a hard time doing it. You know? Yeah. Creative work. It's, it's hard because it's, you have to create the mindset around it in order to actually output an hour worth of creative work. Exactly. exactly. You cannot just like get off a meeting and be right. like, all right, creative work. Right, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know? And I said, cause that's, that's where the vision happens, right? Mm -hmm. That's where the good stuff happens. You know, find, you talk to your team, set aside some time with your teams. They have ideas, help them surface those ideas and then help us help helping my team surface the why behind what they do rather than only the what, mm -hmm. you know, that's been super important in our work is for them to not lose sight of this is why we are here. And more than just to cite statistics, right? Give me examples of, of what an individual got from engaging your program. And when they get back to that moment of that individual connection, it recharges them too. Perfect. Right. And yeah. it helps them think about that sort of creatively a little bit more, like how could I have helped that person? get what they need a little bit more creatively than what we just did. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's beautiful. And uh, sorry, and we, we went on a little bit of a tangent, but I'm going to take us back to the point in which we were talking about Vermont and how um, you disconnected from, from New York City. Um, and so these are some practices that you have used with yourself and your team to be able to disconnect. Any other things you do to recharge and disconnect? Absolutely. So one of the things that I learned to do through my partner was, so my partner's vegan. And okay. so I went from eating my, in New York City, we call them dirty water dogs, right? So like the hot dogs on the street <laughs> and the McDonald's fries and the diner food. I went from doing that to eating much better food that actually nourishes me instead of just fills me up. Wow. And so that was important. That was part of my, you know, understanding who I am as part of this earth rather than just, mm -hmm. you know, running around New York city, you know, in the concrete jungle, you know, it's, it's, just it's, really so, it's so real, like living in Chicago or it's, it's, it's not like New York, but the restaurant and the food culture can suck you in. And oh yeah. Yeah. All of a sudden you're like, take out Monday through Friday <laughs> right. and Saturday and Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We cook at night, you know, we, we make our food, we, you know, and we make spicy food and flavorful food. And we always sit there you know, with our very full bellies and say, oh, poor vegan eating. <laughs> you know, oh, they must suffer so much. You know, it's just funny because, you know, but it's, so it's really important to really make sure they and hydrate. Oh, my goodness. Drink your water. <laughs> get, get a water bottle if you don't have one. You know, so important. But these things we lose sight of because we almost dehumanize ourselves at the pace that we go at. Okay. Right. And if you're, mm -hmm. yeah, oh, no, I was just going to go ahead. Finish. Let's say if, if you're going and going and going without, you know, and you're thinking about what's your next project, what's your deadline, what's this, and you take the human aspect out of that, the fact that you've got to eat well, drink well, get up from your computer and stretch and rehumanize yourself, if you will, get better connected to that human part of who you are and those needs, that's, you're going to burn out like that if you don't sort of make certain that you're taking care of yourself. So, Absolutely. And it's important as leaders to make certain that we're, our teams are doing that. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, so if, if one of my staff walks by me with a water bottle, I'm like, yay, hydration. You know, <laughs> like you can encourage them to do that, you know, or 
you know, they'll ask me, you know, like I'll see them stretching you know, at their desk and I'll say, why don't you take a walk around the block? You know, giving them permission is super important as leaders because they think you're watching them all the time, you know, looking for them to, you know, maybe not do their work or making, you know, having, a, you can't be that kind of leader, right? You want to be a leader that encourages your team to take care of themselves. Beautiful. That's absolutely that's absolutely true. And as a manager, I really uh, follow your your the same your same philosophy or framework to really take care of my people. Mm-hmm. Before b- before we move on to center on Halstead, I really am curious. Pro tips for <laughs> protest. <laughs> oh, there are so much, so many more better, so many better people than I am about these things. I but- mean, you know, I, the protest, right? It's yeah. the Sharpie marker moment with your, you know, writing down your contact on your arm, you know. Wait, or oh, the, yeah, yeah. That's, that's right? You want to yeah. make sure that you've got your contacts written so that if you get arrested, you're not going to forget the phone number, <laughs> right? For all of us who are just accustomed to getting on our cell phones and making those calls, <laughs> if you're being arrested, you can't wait. Hold on, I got to make a call, mm. right? So those kinds of moments, right? Making sure that you understand, you know, as you're moving into something, you know, who are the people? Can you identify the people that you, you might need to go to if there's, you know, an issue? I remember when, you know, the Matthew Shepard protest happened years ago in New York City. They immediately arrested all the leaders of the protest. So everybody was just like, what's happening? Where are we now, going? Next? What are we doing? Yeah, yeah, what's going on? Right. So then you had like 5,000 people kind of <laughs> trying to figure out what we're doing. Right. And it was an amazingly effective protest. We get, you know, the leaders actually got a lot of laws changed, which is amazing. But... If you're going to this protest, like, you know, like my partner loves to make these signs that are incredibly like, um, you know, they really calling out authority, really calling out folks like CPD and systems and things like this. And so I also, I try to also, you know, watch, you know, where is she? What is she doing? Is she okay? You know, so, so, you know, if you're going with somebody, who are your people? Do you know where they are? You know, that's very important. You know, watching and getting the pulse of any sort of police around you. Like, are you on the sidewalk? Or are they going to arrest you immediately for stepping off the sidewalk? You know, making certain that you have all of that sort of in your thoughts as you, you know, it, do you know what the start and the end is? It, Cause if you end up someplace else, have you been, cause this is a tactic, right? Is like, have you been bifurcated from the rest of the, has, from the rest of the protests so that you can be more easily arrested? Those kinds of moments, you know, you want to make certain that you're paying attention to. Wow. So, yeah. There's so much to learn here. I'm, I'm, I am, these are, by the way, these are really good. Tips. I never, <laughs> and know you're right. Right. Yeah. You know, like when, uh, uh, I hate, I, I hate to admit this in public, but it's totally true. I, I, I never protested until Black, Black Lives Matter. And then I, I obviously joined, uh, for, for my value and, and my morals and, it's probably part because of lack of opportunity and part because, uh, you know, like uh, growing up in a different country protest is really not as big. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have to say, like, I just like joined the crowd and then I just followed and um, which is, you know, you know, I, I, I am happy I did that. And at the same time, I should have thought about all of the things. <laughs> oh, and there's so much more. There's so much more about like identification and whether somebody's documented or undocumented. There are so many there and there are great places like beyond legal aid and places like that that teach, you know, help people know their rights. And so yeah, definitely do a little bit of a know your rights training before you go into the protest. <laughs> um do you have a few minutes over the hour? Oh, I do. Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so, okay, now we're moving into the center in Hosted. Would you would love to hear uh, the work that you're doing, what the center is all about, all the good stuff for mm-hmm. context. Great. I always tell people when they say, you know, what do you do as a chief administrative officer? Yeah, what I, do you do? yeah I get that a lot, actually, <laughs> because most people don't know what we do, right? <laughs> They're sort of like, I know there's that person who sits in that office, and they're around a lot. Right. So the, my whole purpose, the way that I interpret my position is to, you know, uh, one, be somebody who uh, helps my CEO to lead in a way that allows him to be very externally facing and very sort of engaged in the world around him so that and I should be taking care of the house so that he's not 
having to worry a lot about what's happening internally, right? Mm -hmm. So the you know, chief operating officer or chief administrative officer really is trying to set up systems so that everything runs smoothly and so that in systems that aren't so cumbersome that nobody wants to do them, right? How many times have you been told, this is a new thing that we're doing at work and then suddenly nobody wants to do it, right? Nope. <laughs> so, how do you, so how do you get people engaged in, in showing them the value of doing something and how it creates greater efficiency so that you get more time to do the things that are really important to you, you know, so let's, but these things have to get done by law or just, you know, because it's the right thing to do. Um, and so we, so I'm working with the teams to set up those systems, right. Is how do I best help, you know, um, the other senior leadership folks to create, you know, connections with the staff so that the, the communication is strong and flows evenly rather than becoming an us in the moment, you know, how do we make certain that I'm working with our senior director of diversity, equity, and inclusion to make certain that we are doing our internal uh, organizational development work in a way that there's great buy-in and people understand why we're doing it and what it means for the work that we're doing externally. So that's the kind of work that I do at Center and Halstead, which is super important because we're the you know Midwest's largest LGBTQ community center. We have the you know a broad array of services because we're a multi-service organization, but we also do so much with the community. So people can come and get an HIV test, behavioral health work, you know, youth housing, senior housing. We do all these things and they can come and watch a play or they can come and play volleyball or they can you know, see an art exhibit. So there's a whole bunch of things that we, you know, a lot of moving parts and a lot of really great team members who are making those parts move pretty seamlessly. Mm -hmm. um, and so Center on Halstead never closed during COVID. Uh, some of our, you know, we didn't, we weren't open as the center for the, fl we had 1400 people come through our doors every day pre COVID that would have been dangerous during COVID. So we, we changed how we did what we did. So we did telehealth for instance, right. Or we did a food pantry, you know, um, for our seniors. And we, uh, went to other youth, our collaborators in the youth, um, services, um, arena and said, we will come to you. So the youth don't have to to travel outside. Mm. So we went to uh, these other organizations to do programmatic work. Um, so we, we stayed in operation and made certain that our community was still getting, you know, what Amazing. they needed. Yeah. Cause if you're, you know, a trans person who now has to go back in shelter in place with a family who does not, you know, who are, are actively harassing you or are violent towards you, you know, or you're in a domestic violence situation or, living with an abusive partner, like they still, folks still needed help. Mm -hmm. And so our teams were right there helping people out. Nice. Um, yeah. I, so I love how, uh, you know, like uh, front, front, frontline workers, part, part of that work was oh continue to support the community and, mm -hmm. and especially the, the, the populations that were mostly at risk. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and still are. Mm -hmm. I always tell people that too, when, you know, when they say, oh, you got marriage equality, we're all done, right? And I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> so much work to still do. <laughs> okay, so good point. What work? Oh my goodness. So you still have people who are aging into systems that aren't necessarily LGBTQ friendly, right? So how do we keep our LGBTQ seniors from going into isolation and how do we keep them engaged? These are people who fought the good fight when it was really dangerous. Yeah to get us to a place where I can have a professional career in a movement that means so much to me. Yeah. Right. So how do we help make certain that they don't just sort of disappear into society or that they're not abused within spaces that, you know, are actively hostile toward them, you mm -hmm. know, um, nursing homes that may not be friendly. fully uh, friendly. Right. You know, other seniors who may not, you know, who may bully them in these spaces too, you know, um, to youth who have been kicked out of their homes. Yeah. Right. Um, there are still parents who will not keep an LGBTQ youth in their home. Horrible. What safety nets? Yes. What safety nets do we provide? So we have housing. We have youth yeah. services. People still need HIV tests. Yes. Right. Like we want to get to zero by 2030. Right. So that we, you know, are in a healthier place and yay for prep and all these wonderful things. People still need HIV tests. So and and those are done in person by our team that like you come into the space and you get your HIV test. We have a prep clinic where people come in and get their prep 
uh, you know, the, all the sort of medical exams that they need, as long, you know, as well as their uh, prescriptions. Um, and, you know, we have anti-violence services because not everybody understands what type of violence a trans person experiences out on the streets and in the world, you know, just walking from home to their, you know, work, you know, what, how was that a dangerous situation or was it, is it dangerous in their workplace for them? You know, are they going to get fired? You know, even though that would be illegal, it doesn't stop people from doing it. Um, You know, keeping the federal government on their toes, we had to sue the federal government, you know, a couple of years back along with land, legal defense and education fund because health and human services, you know, had a denial of care rule that said, go ahead and deny care to whoever you feel a strong religious, you know, uh, motivation to not give health care services to. You know, so we have to, you wow. know, be vigilant with our federal government. We have to be vigilant with the state governments. We have to be make certain that families don't harm their youth or that service providers provide, you know, exceptional care to our communities. Insurance companies still have insurance codes that don't fit the lives of our community. How do they get health care if you can't correctly code cool. in your insurance, right? Like, Absolutely. So there's so many different things we still have to do. Um, and you've got to have the team that, A, understands the issues broadly, like, you know, really gets how these issues are connected, but can go deep enough, too, so that they can do the advocacy work in a way that makes the true change. Mm. Right. Absolutely. And then on the weekend, they're all going out and protesting. So, <laughs> that is so much. Yeah. That is a lot. Like I did not realize the minutia of of the system. And and you and I talked about extensive about this like system <clears throat> system that um that with within within there's a context of the system where it may seem innocuous, mm-hmm. but then if applied to real life scenarios in different groups. It per- creates and perpetuates violence. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. As a scientist and as a person that has done this this work a lot, like uh, system that create and perpetuate violence. Like, how do we? We can have these processes even like I think like even at work, right? Like without realizing them. Mm-hmm. Uh, one one very simple example that comes to mind, and this is nothing compared to what you've just described but like we had uh the type of desk we bought for work had like an open backing so they had no closed backing Uh, but was also expected to dress business casual which meant or business like and which meant that i had to wear skirts and i was very uncomfortable wearing skirts with no backing on 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 my desk because i felt like i could be exposed in some way and and it, it was not nothing special in the case in which it was very personal, um, and so I definitely like addressed it with HR, and you know everything actually turned out to be okay. But you know, like how do how do we make sure that the systems we create are measured and kept accountable for this moment of, of violence that could be big, obviously in situations like the work that you're doing or very much smaller in an office setting or, or just in life in general, like going through life. Sure. Great, great question. Um, and thanks for the lead in. That was helpful. So there are several things that we do. And one of the things, one of the strengths that I think about with Center on Halstead is that unlike a lot of advocacy communities, our entire day is spent working with community in that one-on-one setting, right? Mm -hmm. Or in large group settings where we're having big discussions, right? So we are very connected to community in a way that, you know, that most people, you know, they have to survey for, you know, or something like that. We hear this firsthand every day, you know, how systems are harming people, or we try to get something done with somebody and we realize we can't because the system isn't created to account Mm -hmm. for the needs of our community. And in those moments, what really helps, there's a sort of dual process here. I have to help my teams learn how to spot where the system is failing. Mm, okay. Right. So where is where is that not working for us? Right. And then how to fix it. The other side is working with community to have them identify where the system is failing them so they can t- work with us and talk to us. So I got a root cause analysis from two perspectives from the like the, the supplier and the demand side. Right. Right. So, right. so like your experience with wearing a skirt and feeling 
that vulnerability, <coughs> excuse me, some people may not even be able to identify that, right? Yeah. They know they, something's they, wrong. Yeah. They know something doesn't feel right. They don't know how to frame it. Mm. What about this is doesn't feel right? Or they don't know that they have the actual power to go in and sort of create that change, mm. right? If they do, or, you know, and if it's not working with HR, who do you go to mm. without fear of losing your job or without fear of being reprimanded in some way in whatever situation you're in, right? Yeah. How am I not going to get in trouble with my family? How am I not going to get in trouble with my pastor? How am I not going to, you know, there are all different ways that people feel like they're going to get in trouble. How do we buffer that those moments of reaction of the system, right? To sort of protect what it needs to protect, right? Mm -hmm. How do we expand it to include us and to include our needs? Yeah. So how do we, yeah, how do we train the staff? How do we train the community? How, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, and uh, how do we, uh, so this violence that it creates, like, is there a way to even measure and mm -hmm. keep, for instance, the federal government or any any government accountable for, for this? There's so many different ways to measure, which is why the government also tries to stop, like, with the census, right? LGBTQ folks are fully, it's supposed to be fully engaged, there's, like, plans to have these gauges in the census, in 20, you know, uh, 20, and it was going to be wonderful. And a lot of the questions about our community were pulled right out, right? Because the way that the way that the system works is, I'm going to tell you something bad is happening. The system says, prove it. I don't believe it, right? Domestic violence against women is happening. No, no. Husbands protect their wives. Families are sacred. That wouldn't happen in family. You start to give them examples. That's rare. You know, those are just extreme examples. Okay, we have to go out and start collecting all the data. So our, we have big databases at Center and Halstead. We have forms that people fill out. They collect all this data. And we're part of a larger system of domestic violence service providers or, you know, elder abuse, you know, folks or, you know, youth who are thrown out. So we collect all this data and we all report up into different systems, right, run by coalitions or sometimes by the state, sometimes by the federal government, um, like if the FBI, you know, collects the hate crimes reporting, all that's seriously flawed, but they, you know, it's an attempt, right? And all the systems are flawed. <laughs> you know, we don't yeah. have a perfect way to do this. Yeah, so we, we do all of this reporting and we say, here's the proof. And so that's how we start to get things moved, right? Is we, mm -hmm. you know, but what ends up happening is it does several things, right? It divorces, in some ways, per people's personal experiences as legitimate. The, right? the, 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 the violence happens as the process, as well, what the it, process has to be created. That happens as well. And so what I'm trying to get at, too, is that mm -hmm. if you don't have the numbers and the statistics behind you, it's almost as if my personal, mm -hmm. personally telling you that this happened isn't legitimate. You're gaslighting me. Yeah. yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. You know? And I love that that is something that people understand now after this last presidency. <laughs> so if anything good happened, it's like we understand what a narcissist is and we understand what gaslighting is. Right? <laughs> and so, you know, it, it is that sort of moment of, you know, we're trying to get back to the moments where we're able to help people to surface the stories of what happened in their lives so that we listen wow. and we listen better than, you know, than trying to tick off all of the data points, you know, um, making certain that we don't lose sight that this is a human being in front of us. This is somebody who matters. This is somebody that we have the privilege of being able to leverage our power and our access to make this person's life better. That is so. beautiful and thoughtful work. I am well, I'm very impressed. It's my teams. My teams are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and you. <laughs> uh, um, ooh, uh, okay. I think I, that was like really, really beautiful. And then just to close out this process, once the data comes in and you collect, obviously, the story and make, you know, what you said, it was like resonated with me just, just so that other people can catch it too. It's the fact that you're not only collecting the data, but you're also treating this human being as a person and validating their story, mm -hmm. and their experience, which perhaps they have unvalidated for themselves for so many years of, mm -hmm. of gaslighting or, not, or telling that that's not correct. And 
um, it just, I'm sure it does transformative work into the people that you work, uh, collaborate with or work with. So that's, that's amazing. And once we have this data um, and the stories, then, then how, how does that? We go to our legislators and we start demanding, you know, this is the picture that the data is telling you we need access to this or we, you know, this, this system is broken or, you know, um, we need more money leveraged, you know, to do this work. And so we present folks with the data, whether it be through reporting, you know, through legislative visits, through even writing grants that, uh, that help us get some of this money in, um, so we use all of the data and all of the, you know, uh, you know, to, to make these arguments. And we also use the data to look at what our teams are doing. Mm -hmm. Right. So if I see like, you know, some of our teams have dealt with, uh, you know, maybe somebody who passed away in senior housing or in, you know, the domestic violence world, or, you know, there's some issues around somebody's getting, you know, positive HIV tests, even today is very, you know, traumatizing. If I see a lot of that happening through their reporting, it's time for me to sit down and say, like, how's your team doing? You know, how are you taking good care? How do we make it so that you do the same thing next week and and don't just burn out this week? You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So, it you know, all this data has to go in so many different directions and it's used in so many different ways. It's why it's important to have that, a really strong data set. Wow. That's, that's beautiful. That's definitely important and uh, I didn't, I, I even didn't, this is one of the situations like I didn't even think about, again, we, we've been talking about it, but it still escaped me the fact that the person receiving this information gets the emotional charge of, mm -hmm. of using this information and portraying it correctly and making sure it goes places the right way. And so there's a, a responsibility that they're taking on there emotionally and, and living this experience with a person who's telling the story. Mm -hmm. That's and that's important too. Well, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that work. It's it's amazing and beautiful. Thank you. I you know I I work with probably the best team I could imagine working with. I mean yeah. they're just so dedicated and they really understand the work um, because for them it's very you know when we talk about the personal is political right that for them much of this work is very personal and yes. yeah so just you know, anything that I can do to make their work easier or more effective or, you know, farther reaching, I'm on board, you know. Amazing. And um, just to close out here on this topic, um, what is Center on Hasted uh, doing right now? Are there any community events coming up as things are reopening? What is your plan? If you can give me some insights into uh, what's coming in for the future. Sure, absolutely. So we're doing some, you know, through our uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Uh, we've done wonderful healing circles, and there'll be more of those coming forward. And we have a center for e-learning, so people can, you know, subscribe to the YouTube channel and learn everything from, like, you know, cooking and what, you know, to how to use Zoom to, you know, really sort of, you know, community inspired. Our cyber center is working with elders to or seniors to. Um, learn technical skills around computers. So it's, all of that is still happening, right? All of these things are, are moving forward. We do uh, some great work with uh, community organizers around the violence that impacts mm -hmm. trans folks. Um, people can join those, you know, that work. We have a lot of direct services work and a lot of um, groups that are run, uh, you know, around coming out or, you know, trans identities, things like this. Um, we have groups for BIPOC folks. So you know, people can join those, um, there, you know, the youth group is doing youth pride. So the, you know, people, youth can 18 to, or 13 to 24 can join in on that Saturday programming where uh, 13 to 17 year olds can go into the center and meet other LGBTQ youth. Um, oh, nice. yeah, I mean, so many things, just, yeah. just so much. <laughs> go to the website. And, you know, Perfect. Right? Uh, I'll, I'll leave a link on, of the website. Um, um, the podcast for anybody uh, that wants to go, uh, but otherwise they can find you on, let's see, uh, www.centeronhousted.org. Yes. All right, Kim, this has been fantastic, and I have so much more to ask you, <laughs> but unfortunately, my time with you is running out, and, and you know, I'm going to be respectful of your time, and getting off of the Zoom call. So, 
<laughs> so it's been a pleasure. This has been so much fun. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. But before you go, can we do our last few questions? Yes. Perfect. Okay. What is uh, one thing we don't know about you? One thing you don't know about me. You know, I, trying, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know much about you, but one thing <laughs> surprise me. Do you have seven cats hiding? I don't. But I think one thing that people don't know about me that I think might be interesting is uh, that I am a big fan of cozy mysteries. So what is these? What is I know. So <laughs> for me, they are, um, and I'm very specific about these. Uh, and I and um, they are mysteries that usually take place from around 1820 to 1920, 1930. Okay. Those are the, that's the, the time frame I like. There's a female protagonist usually who's just kind of doing life and, just go, and then stumbles upon a murder oh. and has to figure out what happened. And it's just, they're just fun. You know, I probably read about, you know, I listen to them on, I do audiobooks, So I probably listened to about 300 of them. <laughs> wow. I you know I have a favorite that them. comes to mind that I, I would, I'm really into this. <laughs> <laughs> that is great there's a there's a i mean there's just so many different ones that i really like um yeah. uh there's like her royal spineness uh you know it's a i will i will send you some there's there's just so many good ones i'll take i'll, take, I'll start with that one because it came to mind first so and, and they have like really catchy names so i i like that too excellent excellent uh so is so uh, my next question was what book do you give the most do you have a recommendation for a book but if this is it we can take this and roll do you have I, other books that you've gifted you know yeah i do you know and i was i was thinking about this because books i i'm not in that sphere anymore where like you know first you know where i have a lot of books because i listen to them a lot okay. of them. but well, the book that i would say that i i have gifted most is called this bridge called my back and it's from like 1983 and I've I can't tell you the number of times I've bought this book and it has, and I've gifted it out. It's okay. still relevant. It is still relevant today. And it's writings by radical women of color. And it you know even though it was written so many years ago, the themes really resonate today. Okay, and it's called. Sorry, I didn't hear you. So it's called this bridge called my back, and it's been reprinted. I think it's in its fourth edition by this point. Uh, and then Google in here looks like her name is Rosario Morales. Does that sound right? No, oh, the so the two um, uh, editors are Shri Moraga and Gloria Anzalua. Okay. And they can just know. Perfect. Okay. Awesome. Um, what is a book you would write? I, <laughs> I think I would actually write a cozy mystery. With Perfect. a with a with a lesbian main character Twist. because they don't have them for the most part, and so I want to see what that looks like. I that's what, I would I would read that I would listen to <laughs> it or read it. It's it sounds really fun. <laughs> it sounds fun. Deal with all those issues of you know coming out in the early nineteen hundreds kind of thing. Yeah, I think even just going through the exercise of writing a book about it could be interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. How, do you, how do you even do it the back then? You, maybe you just don't. I don't know. Yeah. That would be a nice world. Um, what is, uh, not that you don't come out, meaning that you don't need to. Oh, no. I, yes. No, I got it. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> Explain. <laughs> Explain. Um, what is uh, one lesson? Just wrapping up here. What is one lesson that uh, through your work has stuck with you um, that you think we want to talk about today to the audience. The, you know, I had so many lessons. This yeah. is the one that I just kind of kept writing and writing and writing. But I will say, you know, and very specifically thinking about women in leadership in this moment, right? Um, when I think about this, I think about like uh, how often we go through our careers without really writing down and identifying the places that we have moved something or that we've been the prime movers on, right? So that when it comes time for us to do so job interviews for like higher level jobs, for instance, um, and they say, well, tell me about your wins or tell me what you've done. So many of us don't have those answers readily available, right? So make certain that every quarter or so you're going through what you've done. And if, if you can ask yourself, can I put this on my resume as something I've moved or as something I've done? And if you can't, a, ask yourself, are you doing your job in a way that you should be doing it to sort of move your career forward? 
or are you in a in an organization that doesn't value that and how do you get your organization to start valuing that right so what are you know some people will say identify your key performance indicators your KPIs right and they have all this technical language around it but you really do want to sort of amass those in the work that you're doing because and as women, we often don't do that. You know, we often say, well, I was part of a team. I, and I can't tell you a number of times I've interviewed um, cis men and cis women who will say, you know, have a very different understanding of what their role as an organization was, you yeah. know, and women really, really sort of invest in like their teams and, and that kind of language. Um, so it makes a guy sound like, oh, look, but he's led all these things, right? And what I'm saying is own what you've done, you know, mm -hmm. acknowledge your teams, Absolutely. And say, but, and this is what my part of it was, you know, and pull it out in a way that you can put that on your resume. Right. Yeah. And I say the same thing to the people who I work directly with my, my direct reports is I say, what would you put on your resume? You know, I'll say, I'm not asking you to leave. I don't want you to go anywhere, but are you building a resume by, you know, can you pull that information out from the work you're doing? Nice. Well, that was the perfect ending to this interview. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, thank you for your great insight. And I hope to. I hope you come back sometime. I want oh, to that would be fantastic. Awesome. Thank you so much.